Hello, hi. Um, welcome to this week's seminar. Um, my name is Jan Hendrik Bredehüft. I'm from the University of Bremen in Germany. And today I would like to talk a bit about comets and whether they really are the cradle of creation or whether they represent something more akin to nature without life. This actually ties in pretty nicely with the talk that uh, Christian uh, Johnson Finn gave two weeks ago, where she also touched on the subject, what kind of synthesis is possible without the intervention of any life. She discussed this more in the context of biosignatures, where this is obviously very important. Um, but I would like to take up this idea and talk a bit about the origins of life and how comets might or might not be connected to that. So, uh, hang on. Yeah. So, first chapter, very brief recap of what do I mean by origins of life? You probably all know this very uh, famous figure by Jerry Joyce. Um, where he detailed a few key moments in the formation of Earth, the uh, prebiotic chemistry, the pre RNA world, and then first DNA protein life and the diversification later. Um, I would like to adapt this very slightly. Uh, Thomas Hennis? Doesn't have any sound. Do you others hear me? I have no issue. I can hear you very well. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, I have adapted this very slightly um, because I sort of disagree with some of the dates. And uh, also, um, he really made this to drive home the, the, the point where the whole RNA world happened. And we can't be 100% sure that um, this actually really happened. So I have adapted this timeline very slightly. And um, yeah, going back, very, very short history of life. I mean, if we talk about origins of life, we need to talk about, we need to define what it is that we actually talk about. And about 400 million years ago, uh, life on land started. And that's actually pretty recent in geologic times. Um, yeah, the invention of two different sexes is about 600 million years old. And this was more or less the first thing that multicellular organisms came up with, which also are still relatively young when viewed in the context of uh, the origin of Earth and its life. Before that, the last really major milestone was the incorporation of mitochondria about 2 billion years ago. And uh, yeah, the cell nucleus and the invention of eukaryotes about two and a half billion years ago. And we know that from about three and a half billion years ago, we have photosynthesis. And really the first organisms that actually left fossil imprints are about 3.7 billion years old. There are some structures where people claim that they were older fossils, but they are not unambiguous. In some cases, it's not really clear whether it's an actual fossil. And in other cases where it's pretty clear that it is a fossil, the dating of the rock is not as straightforward. So we can say that we can safely say that 3.7 billion years ago, there were living organisms on Earth that actually left fossils. Well, these first fossils, I mean, fossils you've all known, you've all seen in, in museums of natural history, they usually look something like this. And there are a couple of very beautiful, very large examples, but the fossils that we are talking about look nothing like this. These are clearly multicellular organisms, so they are clearly much, much younger than the first fossils we're looking at. And yeah, as I said, the fossils that we are dealing with when talking about the origins of life and the very first organisms usually look something more like this. Some little groove in some random rock and you can see that there's a lot of room to argue about whether this is really a fossil or 
something abiotic. And also finding rocks that are these that are this old and dating these is also not really very straightforward. But as I said, 3.7 billion years ago, we are fairly sure that we had organisms that resemble organisms that still live on this planet today. Well, coming from the other direction, not origins of life, but the uh, formation of stable Earth, we know that about 4.7 billion years ago, we had the formation of a proto-Earth, which then resumed Earth's mass and shape with the impact that created the moon, that was about four and a half billion years ago. And then it took another 300 or so million years for Earth to cool down enough to form a stable hydrosphere. A stable hydrosphere means oceans, clouds, rain, water on the surface. Um, we know that up until about 3.8 billion years ago, there was something called the late heavy bombardment, which was basically the time when yeah, the inner solar system was cleaned up of all the failed attempts of planet formation, planetesimals, large rocks that rained down um, not only on Earth, but on all the bodies in the inner solar system. And yeah, these were some pretty big impacts. So if both of the timelines are combined, we have the formation of something resembling Earth after about 4.2 billion years. Up until 3.8 billion years ago, we had sterilization events. They might not have been global sterilization events, but they very well could have been. Yeah, and then we have like the creation of life and its evolution. And we have the first fossils from 3.7 billion years ago, which leaves something like a hundred million years or so for the origin of life and the evolution of life up to a point where organisms actually leave fossils. And this was for a very long time thought to be a showstopper for the origins of life on earth. But now not, not the origins of life, sorry, but the whole chemical evolution needed to form the first origin uh, form the first organisms on earth because 100 million years time is awfully short if you think about all the chemical evolution and all the buildup of complexity that is needed to form early organisms one of the ways out of this was looking at the skies so if the time on earth was not sufficient to evolve the chemistry that is needed to form the first living proto-organism, then maybe some pretty highly evolved, chemically highly evolved species were imported to earth. And people started pointing out, starting in the 60s, um, some pretty striking similarities between the IR spectrum of living systems uh, and the prebiotic chemistry experiments like Miller-Urey experiment and others and interstellar dust clouds. And while I do have some doubts about the conclusions that people draw uh, drew, especially looking at some of the more outlying stuff like this one, like the dried uh, uh, remnants of E. coli overlaid with um, the IR spectrum for some uh, interstellar cloud. I don't think that interstellar clouds are made up out of dried up E. coli bacteria, but there is some similarity and that led to people taking a very, very close look at interstellar chemistry and what can be learned about interstellar chemistry. And one of the biggest windfalls for this type of science was the fall of the meteorite Murchison in September 1969, uh, um, which came at a time where all over the earth, there were a couple of very, very well-equipped labs waiting for the Apollo 11 moon rocks. And uh, yeah, all these labs standing by rushed to uh, do very, very in-depth analysis of Murchison. And the meteorite is, well, 
probably the best studied meteorite to date. And also since it was collected more or less immediately after its fall, is thought to be less contaminated by earthly life than other meteorites which had been sitting in a lake for a couple of hundred years before they were found. So the study of the Murchison meteorite really, really kicked off the study of interstellar chemistry and the complexity in interstellar chemistry. Um, yeah, starting in the late 60s and continuing on to this day. Um, the methods of analysis have improved considerably since 1969, especially in terms of mass spectrometry and big data methods. And uh, this is from a paper from Alexander Roux from 2018, where uh, he found several tens of thousands of different compounds in the Murchison meteorite. And um, any modern analysis of the Murchison or other carbonaceous chondrite meteorites um, presented a staggering wealth of organic molecules and of organic complexity. We find amino acids, we find fatty acids, we find lipids, we find nuclear bases, we find sugars, we find hydroxy uh, compounds. So if you can name it, if you can draw the chemical formula, then it is very, very, very likely that it can be found in a meteorite. And um, the, the, the question really is, well, this is a very promising uh, uh, feedstock for chemical evolution on Earth. There are some fairly complex mixtures of some fairly large molecules in there. And the question then turned to, how does this actually form? And many of you might know that um, the organic chemistry content in meteorites is mostly created through a process called aqueous alteration, where on the meteorite parent bodies, um, there were chemical changes over a very long time that happened in liquid water or in pseudo liquid crystal water, where um, yeah, the precursor material to that um, is commonly believed to increase in complexity and molecular wealth, basically. Um, through this process of aqueous alteration. Recent research, however, has shown that molecular complexity actually decreases during aqueous alteration. So the Tagish Lake meteorite, which is another very well studied meteorite, um, shows different degrees of aqueous, aqueous alteration in different parts. And the parts that are least altered by water are actually the ones with the highest chemical complexity. And this means that the precursor meteor uh, material to meteorites, which is thought to be found in comets or most closely resembles that of comets, must already be very, very complex. Because if chemical alteration by water on the meteorite parent body decreases the complexity slightly, and we still find this enormous complexity in the meteorites that fall, then the starting material must already be very, very complex in nature. And the stuff that is usually believed to be the best proxy for this starting material for meteorite parent bodies are actually comets. Comets are very small bodies in the solar system that are made from the ice and dust of the protoplanetary disk. They contain the oldest material that can be found in the solar system. And uh, it might even be possible to find relatively unchanged material that predates the formation of planets. So the, there are pre-solar grains in meteorites as well. And it is thought that the uh, carbonaceous and silicaceous dust that comets contain also predate the solar system. So this is really very, very pristine. And the nucleus of a comet is made from yeah, ice mixed with silicaceous and carbonaceous dust grains. And the ice itself is mostly water, but it has a few percent of organic molecules mixed in. And this is a very primitive ice, primitive in the sense that it's very little altered by uh, being close to the sun. 
but there it's not entirely unchanged. So this is not entirely one to one the protoplanetary disk or the uh, nebula that eventually collapsed to form the solar system. There is some radiation driven chemistry going on and uh, the, the chemical composition changes slowly over time in a slow and steady synthesis of larger, never more complex molecules. Yeah, comets are mostly known for their tails, which also give them their German name of Schweifstern, which is tail star. And that tail is formed by erosion of dust and gas from the coma by solar winds. And this is also why the tail is not dragged behind the comet in its path, like it's often depicted, but it's actually pointing away from the sun because the solar wind erodes this dust and the tail points away from the sun and is not an indication of the sort of direction in which the comet is traveling. And besides the readily visible dust tail, there's an ion tail as well. And I don't know whether you can really see it very well. There's a faint blue line striking up here. And uh, so this is the two tails that have. And um, what we are mostly interested in, though, is the nucleus. So this is the part of the comet that is hardest to observe remotely. But this is where the chemistry happens. Much of the chemistry happens. Oh yeah, I've actually got annotations in the picture, sorry. Um, so what do we think is uh, the comet nucleus really made of and how does it form? And one admittedly rather old model for that, but it's still nice uh, because it illustrates the point very well. It's a sort of Greenberg model of interstellar dust particles. And the comet is believed to be a collection of frozen interstellar dust particles, basically a, a conglomerate. And the Greenberg model basically says that if there are grains, which can be formed in like the remnants of a supernova where the silicon uh, content of a star is blown out and sort of crystallizes to form these amorphous grains, same with carbon. And these very, very tiny grains, micrometer, sub-micrometer size, they are very cold. They are at the same sort of 10 Kelvin or so uh, of the interstellar medium, which means that any molecule that strikes the dust grain like this will freeze in place. Apart from helium and probably hydrogen H2, which in terms of chemistry isn't really that interesting because there's not a lot of reactions going on. So I'm discarding this here, but all the other elements or molecules that hit the dust grain will freeze in place. And since uh, the dust grain is subject to radiation. There is a bit of chemical, um, yeah, chemical reaction going on in the in the mantle of these dust grains, which means that a lot of radical species or reactive species are formed, which cannot immediately react because it is so cold. So there's very little diffusion at ten or so Kelvin. So. Uh, any bond that is sort of cleaved by the uh, by the radiation that doesn't immediately recombine will probably be frozen in place in, in uh, as yeah as a radical or other reactive species. If the grain receives some warming in some way, the first combination reactions can occur. These will usually be exothermic, meaning they will warm up the grain further, which will speed up the reaction further, which will liberate more energy, which uh, heats the grain further. And this leads to frequent explosions of the ice mantles in the things called explosive desorption event, which is actually believed to be the one of the major sources for molecules in the gas phase that can be observed by our IR spectroscopy. There are certain molecules in the gas phase that shouldn't be there if um, the only way of getting into the gas phase is thermal desorption because large and complex molecules like polyaromatic hydrocarbons actually have uh, de decomposition temperatures that are below their uh, boiling point or, or, or desorption energy. So these can only be brought into the gas phase by mechanical means not by heating up. Some of the remaining ice 
will stay on the uh, uh, on the grain. This is ice that is fairly highly processed already. And this starts sort of a condensation nucleus for the next round. And there can be many, many rounds of adsorption of chemical species, altering by radiation, frequent explosive desorption events. And with each of these cycles, the chemical complexity grows a little bit. And each of these cycles can take a couple of hundred million years, but time is really not pressing anymore. There has been plenty of time for this before the solar system even formed. So the starting materials in terms of chemical compounds and chemical complexity for the stuff that eventually ends up in comets is, can be already pretty complex. Yeah, um, problem with that is, in contrast to meteorites, finding a comet to drag into your lab and do thorough analysis on is very, very hard. So we need to um, come up with some ways of recreating this kind of chemistry. And this is the second chapter in my talk. How do we actually look at comets? One thing that we do is we simulate cometary ice in the laboratory. And um, this looks somewhat different from your standard issue chemistry lab, because the chemistry really occurs in an environment that is very different from what we normally have uh, yeah, in chemical synthesis. Usually, efficient chemical synthesis relies on sufficiently mixing ingredients and the reaction speed and turnover of a reaction is very often dictated by various transport phenomena meaning that if two reaction partners can actually find each other they will readily react and the speed of the reaction is determined by the speed of partners finding each other um, this is due to the fact that room temperature or the slightly elevated temperatures of chemical reactors provide ample thermal energy to overcome any reaction barriers. So whenever two reaction partners encounter each other, there will be enough energy for them to react. This is very, very much not the case on comets. As I said, on comets, temperature can still be as low as 10 Kelvin or so, which means there is not enough energy for overcoming normal reaction barriers. And also the transport processes that actually govern how well two reaction partners will encounter each other are also extremely slow. But the near absence of any thermal energy does not mean that there are no chemical reactions on the comet or on interstellar dust rates. There are some very elaborate reaction networks that are known to exist. And the one I've given here is just from, um, uh, I think I took that, took that from a master's thesis of one of my students where he looked at the mixtures of ammonia and CO and what they can do. And this is a very, very, very simple system. And still there's a lot of complexity going on already there. So the chemistry that is driven on comets and on interstellar dust grains is not driven by temperature, by thermal energy, but it's driven by radiation. And radiation in this sense can be photochemistry, but more often it is ionizing radiation. And the slow electrons that are liberated through ionizing radiations are actually the agents that drive much of the chemistry. However, if you look at the literature, literature regarding chemical uh, reactions on these kind of systems, you very often find studies that are not done by chemists, but by various other disciplines. And a typical reaction mechanism looks something like this. You have a molecule, you have that interact with some random agent that will blow apart the molecule into its uh, component atoms, and these will magically dance to form some sort of products. And I'm oversimplifying this, 
this is not actually what's written in the literature, but um, what you can find in some papers is actually pretty close to that. And there are some problems with this kind of view. So stoichiometry is mostly observed, meaning count your particles. There should be as many atoms in your products as there are in your starting materials. But this does not only include atoms, but also electrons. And this is very often not observed. You have random occurrences of radicals and of ions, and then they spontaneously discharge and find electrons or shed something. So this needs to be observed if you are uh, proposing reaction mechanisms. Um, the other thing that's, that's problematic with this kind of view is that not all bonds are equally likely to dissociate. Some atoms are very, very tightly bound and you need a lot of energy to break them apart and others need far less energy. And these bonds are far more easy to dissociate. So um, the model that you sort of strip all the atoms apart and reassemble, the, uh, reassemble them in, in some other way doesn't really hold very well. Another thing is that the range of products in this kind of view does often not match or the, the prediction of these, kind, these kinds of models actually very often don't match the range of products that we actually find. And the very, very, thick, very big thing is the impacting particle does not simply disappear. If there's a fast electron or an ion or something, this is not only there to deliver energy, but these particles can and will also participate in reactions. And yeah, the one question I ask the most when I read something like this is people talk about ionizing radiation and then they have absolutely no ions in their reaction schemes. So what do I propose is a better view? And as I said, I propose that the secondary electrons are really very important and your primary impactor will liberate a shower of, if it's fast and heavy enough, will liberate a shower of secondary electrons. And these secondary electrons have a typical energy distribution, something like this. So there's a little influence on the nature of the impactor. There's a little influence uh, with regards to the energy of the impactor, but um, the energy spectrum of the secondaries that are liberated is mostly dictated by the uh, matrix from which it comes and by the work function of that. And in water ice, it's typically centered around 10 electron volts with a pretty sharp decline and almost no uh, uh, electrons faster than maybe 100 electron volts. And this is this range of energies for the secondary electrons is very fortuitous because secondary electrons are very powerful uh, drivers of chemical changes. And uh, the slow electrons, especially in the, in the region between zero and maybe 20 electron volts of, of uh, kinetic energy, um, will form a number of very, very reactive species. We can form mutual radicals, we can form radical cations, we can form radical anions, and all of these can be very, very reactive. And in the condensed phase, these will usually immediately react with neighboring molecules, even at temperatures as low as 10 Kelvin, because these kinds of reactions have essentially no energy barrier to overcome. And while the reaction conditions are pretty exotic in uh, with regards to yeah like a standard chemistry lab the reaction products and also the reaction pathways that these reactive intermediates created by secondary electrons trigger are surprisingly mundane they are more often than not very well known and sort of boring compounds and boring mechanisms that are very well documented in normal, yeah, um, everyday radical organic chemistry. So while the conditions might be very, very special and why uh, triggering chemical reactions by secondary electrons might sound slightly outlandish, um, this is actually a very, very normal type of chemistry. So 
Okay. Uh, moment. Right here. Um, so the conditions on a comet nucleus, temperatures between say 10 and maybe 50 Kelvins, extreme low atom numbers in the gas phase, and the effects of very hot ionizing radiation. These are all things that can be, can be recreated in the lab. And this is what we do in our lab. We have a ultra high vacuum chamber. There's a photo up here, uh, sorry, a photo up here behind all the aluminum foil. Um, there's a little chamber. There's a schematic down here. So um, we have a cold surface here. We have an electron source here. We have a mass spectrometer to look at what's in the gas phase. And then we can do reactions where we uh, admit gases into the chamber. It's here. And they will freeze out on the cryostat. We keep that at around 30 Kelvin. Um, during the deposition, we can check the purity of the compounds that we let in by the mass spectrometer. Um, we can then irradiate the mixture with electrons. And that is also very nice in comparison to in comparison to photochemistry because counting electrons is really trivial. You just measure a current. Counting photons is much harder to do. Also, having energy resolutions in electrons is much, much simpler than in photochemistry. You just apply a potential between the tip of your electron source and your sample, and that potential determines the kinetic energy of the electrons. It's very easily tunable. Having a tunable UV light source where you can actually count the photons is disproportionately harder to do in the lab than using electrons. So this is actually quite neat. Um, after irradiation, we slowly warm up the sample, usually by one Kelvin per second. And then we monitor whatever comes off the surface, goes into the gas phase by mass spectrometry. And we can do that for a range of energies, with energy resolutions down to maybe a half or so electron volt. And we can do this for many, many masses. And this is, again, the example of mixing ammonia and CO. So we mix ammonia and CO. We look at isocyanic acid, which is the top curve. We look at formamide, which is the lower curve. We look at uh, the ammonia that simply desorbs. We look at hydrazine. Uh, this is more hydrazine. We look at the formation of HCN at different masses. And for all of these products, we have the energy dependence of their formation, which tells us a lot about the processes that lead to the formation of these. And if I pick one of these, where are we here? We have this reaction scheme where we start with ammonia and CO, and by successive electron treatment of these, we can form radical anions, we can form uh, radicals that decompose into various other species, and then there's a lot of uh, recombination and mixing going on according to the laws of organic chemistry, and we end up at the stable compounds, HCN and uh, formamide, for instance. So this is what we do in the lab, but how do we know that this actually uh, is relevant in terms of looking at comets? And we did go and check uh, almost 10 years ago. We landed the Rosetta lander uh, filet on comet 67P churyumov gerasimenko And we actually did analyses on the comet. The first thing that we learned is that landing on a comet is very hard. Actually staying landed on the comet is even harder. Um, and because of a slightly less than ideal landing with a couple of bounces and tumbling, uh, we ended up in a spot where the lander didn't really, couldn't really fulfill their, its full potential because we had uh, only one of the three or four solar panels in the sun. So there was a lot less energy uh, uh, than we wanted. And also we sort of ended up wedged uh, sitting on the, on the face of a cliff. So drilling into the ground was also kind of hard if you're sitting on the wall, but we still learned a lot about the chemistry. And uh, Guillaume Lessinger, 
who's also in the, uh, in this talk today. And I uh, looked at the original data from the 2014, 2015 paper, and we did a very thorough analysis. So in the, in the seven years or so since uh, the publication of the first paper, there were a whole host of um, yeah, different, I, I had different ideas in the literature on how to improve this. And we took all of them, applied all of them, did, redid the analysis and found much the same result as the first paper. So what we wrote in the first paper is still very much valid, but there's a refinement step uh, available now. And um, what it did reveal is that we have a sort of, of um, mixture of compounds I call the first second and the third generation products. So first generation products are really, um, or so, uh, so, sorry, I didn't hear it's like primitive and first and second generation. So the primitives are the one, the, 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 the compounds that really react by combining atoms that come attached to the uh, surface of the dust grain, move around a bit, find a partner and then form a molecule. And if you take any two of these primitives, and have them react with each other, you end up with these first generation products. So you can see here, if you mix uh, methane and ammonia, you get um, methylamine. And if you mix the CO and ammonia, this is the, the diagram that I showed you earlier, you get isocyanic acid, you get HCN, and you get formamide. And in the same way, you can mix all the other ingredients to form other compounds. And if you take these, and have them react with another primitive again, then you form sort of these second generation products. And we find a very rich organic chemistry in uh, these kind of systems. And we can find alcohols, we can find aldehydes, we find ketones, ethers, amines, amides, nitriles, and many, many more. So um, these already include many molecules interesting for chemical evolution. Because of the nature of our landing, we can't really look at the larger molecules. We are sort of limited to whatever is sufficiently volatile that at the 15 to 18 degrees centigrade of the uh, instrument is actually in the gas phase. But already here, we can see a pretty wide variety of compounds in a large molecular complexity. Which brings me neatly to the third chapter. That's very nice. If there's molecular complexity in comets already and uh, also meteorites, but how, how is this relevant to the origins of life on Earth? How do we actually get this stuff on Earth? And the first thing you could think of would be the late heavy bombardment. And in recent years, there's been some doubt about how late that late heavy bombardment might have been and also might not have been as heavy as, uh, as, as first thought, but there's absolutely no doubt that millions of tons of organic carbon have reached the earth since its formation. And also there's estimates that between one third and quote unquote, almost all water on earth was actually delivered by comets and planetesimals after the formation of earth. So there's absolutely no doubt that we've seen a huge influx of both carbon compounds and water since the formation of Earth. And this is not only something that happened 3.8 billion years ago, this is something that is still ongoing. So each year, several tons of organic carbon enter Earth's atmosphere. The vast majority of that actually reaches the surface totally unharmed and intact because it sticks to grains that are sort of in the microgram range, which are not uh, fast enough that they, uh, yeah, that they uh, suffer plasma heating and chemical changes. So much of the interstellar dust that's raining on Earth reaches Earth's surface completely unharmed. And there's tons and tons of carbon every year that are delivered in this way. Funnily, meteorites with sort of sizes in the several kilogram range, which we know about a lot and which we can collect and do analysis on, are really the outliers. Much of the mass comes from really huge impactors that hit every three 
every few billion years only, but then deliver enormous amounts of, of substance. And the slow and steady rain of yeah, microgram particles and meteorites are actually the exotic outliers. But we know a lot about these exotic outliers. So um, while we might not know all the details of the chemistry on comets, we do have uh, a good general idea of what can and can't be formed from comets and meteorites by extensions. And whether this inventory of organic chemistry has had anything to do with the origins of life on Earth or possibly on other planets is much less certain. There are a lot of questions and caveats attached to the transport, to the atmospheric entry, impact on the surface of the planet, how this will change organic molecules. There's a couple of, of uh, very um, well-equipped and very clever groups of people studying just that, and they find that you can actually do shock synthesis. So um, this is pretty complex. Um, and even if delivery to Earth of this sort of chemical soup in meteorites and comets does not change the chemistry in any meaningful way, crashing these into a global ocean will dilute these to meaninglessness. So, um, yeah, while the chemical complexity of comets and meteorites is really surprising and a lot of stuff could also be used to form cells, I don't see a ready connection between what is happening in the outer solar system on isostellar industrial rains and the actual origins of life on a planet, because there are a lot of, lot of question marks attached to all the little steps that are needed in between. Also, in recent years, a lot of very convincing and clever theories have been proposed on the, the sort of generation of the chemical compounds that are needed to start the first life. And yeah, I've picked this picture here from a picture from a paper by Christian Meyer and Uli Schreiber. And this is one of the clever molecule, uh, clever models um, that really, really changed our view about how fast chemical evolution can happen. As I said earlier, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, everyone assumed that 100 million years between the last sterilization events and the first fossils is much, 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 much too short a time to fit all the chemical evolution, start of life, and the first biological evolution into that. But more modern um, theories on the origin of life and the, the, the sort of uh, chemical evolution preceding it um, have shown that this might be an ongoing and fast and continuous process. And the exogenous delivery of organics is no longer needed to come up with a plausible theory for the origins of life. So this brings me to my conclusion chapter, chapter four, nature without life. What do I mean by that? Um, yeah, first, you probably agree that what you can see on this picture depicts nature. It is a photograph, of a bunch of trees and trees are living beings that are tens of meters tall and they weigh several tons. And from what we know, these are extremely rare in the universe. So this is really on a universal scale, extremely exotic. And we associate nature with life that has not been altered by human interaction too much. So we actually have this dichotomy of nature versus culture and saying we describe things as natural if they are living and they haven't been tampered with by humans too much. That makes sense if you're looking at Earth. If you're looking at the rest of the universe though, nature everywhere else will look much more like this than the beautiful Zarschleife picture. And while planetary surfaces that are shaped by the presence of life are certainly natural, just look out the window, there's a good example. 
they are extremely unusual. Nature usually is very much different from that of Earth. And the scientific discipline used to describe nature most universally is certainly geology rather than biology, if you exclude this one outlying data point of Earth. So what is nature then, if I say nature without life? As we are very much biased in our perception of what qualifies as nature, as human beings, we might as well try a scientific view. And if we want to be scientific about it, we might as well try something to define nature. And since we're talking about the concept of chemical evolution most of the time, we might as well try and use the science of chemistry for it. Not because this, this is the most basic and uh, best suited kind of science, but because it's the one that I know best. And a chemist's view would say that the most basic law of nature in terms of chemistry is delta G is smaller than zero. So the Gibbs free enthalpy tends toward a minimum. This, I would argue, is the most basic chemical law describing natural processes. And any process that minimizes the Gibbs free enthalpy will occur spontaneously and is thus natural. Observing processes like that, without the meddling interactions of enzymes and catalytic cell networks and stuff, is extremely hard to do on Earth. There is virtually no space on Earth that has not been touched and tainted by life. So if we really want to look at this kind of, sorry, this kind of nature, um, Comets are one possible window into this kind of nature without life. And the study of comets, while they might not be immediately relevant to the origins of life, is still very, very relevant and very, very interesting um, because they can give us a view of what chemistry and nature on Earth and elsewhere looked like before there was life. Plus, comets are also really very cool. So this is what I would like to argue for today. Uh, if you have any questions or differing views, want to hurl insult at me, please feel free to do now. Thank you. Ah, okay, there's a question in the chat saying that, uh, do I think that the hypothesis of panspermia is obsolete because of the fact that any material delivered to Earth would have been diluted, so any reactions would have been impossible? Mm, well, if you, if you talk about like proper, uh, uh, yeah, theory of panspermia, this means that there's actually living organisms transported all over the universe and whenever they find a suitable planet they will colonize it. Um, this is certainly not hindered by dilution. If you drop a bunch of microbes into the ocean um, they can sort of find their little niche and uh, yeah, start a colony somewhere. Because you've already gotten round to, of, to around the problem of um, mixing all the ingredients in just the uh, right way and bringing them together and giving them order and sort of all the, the complicated bits are already over. I do, however, think that the hypothesis of panspermia in terms of delivery of living organisms um, to explain the origins of life is not a very good theory because you just push out the problem of emergence of life to a different place and a different time and you solve none of the problems. Also, um, yeah, we haven't really found any traces of that. So I think panspermia was a very interesting idea. It's very much a brainchild of the 60s and 70s. Uh, much the same way like the, the Gaia hypothesis where you could say that 
the whole earth, the whole ecosystem is the actual living thing. But yeah, with a bit of sort of mm, with a bit of temporal distance between now and then, I'd say that these theories, at least in my personal view, and feel free to argue differently, um, are not really very good theories on the origins of life. Which experiment techniques do you apply to characterize the molecular compounds? Yeah, so in the lab, um, we do uh, gas phase mass spectrometry. And um, the mass spectra and the, the sort of fragmentation patterns are usually um, a good indication of the formed products. And we can sort of be more sure that we are actually looking at the right compound by comparing the desorption temperature as well. So it is not a proper chromatography in the sense that we separate stuff, but the combination of uh, sort of desorption temperature, also sometimes shape of the desorption peak and uh, the mass spectrometer, uh, mass spectrum gives us a very good assignment of what it is that we're actually forming. On the comet, um, we did mass spectrometry, but um, again, we didn't really separate the compounds. So we just analyzed whatever happened to be in the uh, ionizing chamber of the mass spectrometer, which made the whole analysis kind of difficult because the instrument was really not built for analyzing complete mixtures by mass spectrometry alone. This was supposed to be the detector of a GCMS. Um, and this is why there's some ambiguity in the, in the, in the assignment of peaks, but it's yeah, basically also gas phase uh, mass spectroscopy. Uh, yeah, we don't look at the ice surface. Um, well, we can do infrared spectroscopy in reflection but we've sort of stopped doing that a couple of years ago because it's really not worth the effort. So if we are doing experiments with slow electrons, we need to have very, very thin films like 10, 12, 15 or so monolayers. And the intensity in uh, reflection absorption infrared spectroscopy is very, very good compared to uh, just shining the IR beam through the sample. But if you are talking at monolayer uh, uh, adsorption on a surface and then some few percent of, of chemical uh, turnover, then you don't really see anything much. We can do that, we have the capability, but we rarely use it because we would need much thicker samples for this to work better. And then we are not transparent to the electrons anymore. We have charging effects and we get all kinds of uh, other problems. So um, the ice surface, we don't really look at, but we uh, follow the literature very closely. And there are other groups that use uh, other methods of irradiating the ice where they can use sort of thicker samples, basically the Kaiser group in Hawaii and uh, um, yeah, Krishna Kuma uh, to some extent in, in, uh, in India. Um, so they do uh, infrared and other techniques. And if we look at similar systems, we can sort of, uh, yeah, use their insights um, to further our understanding of the chemistry that's going on. Ah, oh, yeah, Bill Irvin asked dilution not in an ocean but in a pond. Yeah, that's something that's frequently brought up. And I also always thought this was a very neat solution to the uh, dilution problem until I talked to a bunch of geologists that told me that these kind of ponds will usually erode within a couple of years. So if you have a shallow pond, especially like on the slope of a volcano or so, this should disappear within. 100 years maximum by erosion. So um, 
yeah origins of life and then sort of uh, the evolution of life to grow some sort of propulsion to move to a different habitat would have been extreme would have needed to be extremely quick to uh, get around that problem <laughs>